started. Um, so Randy, our uh, fourth panelist here, so hopefully he'll show up. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll um, uh, have him uh, in the panel as whenever he shows up. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's get started. Um, informally, we have already started a few minutes ago. Um, my name is Hitesh. Uh, I am uh, an EIR at a, um, a relatively um, new venture partnership based out of San Francisco, um, uh, Silicon Valley Growth Syndicate. Uh, we have invested in around 60 different um, um, startups over the last year and a half. Uh, my background, here uh, and here is Randy. So a round of applause for Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so um, my background before that, uh, I, um, my um, uh, <laughs> I, I started as a developer 20 years ago. Um, and um, uh, over the um, last few years, um, went through this cycle a couple of times uh, myself to start a company and, and, and uh, uh, been on the uh, early days of uh, being a founder. Um, and um, uh, uh, now, you know, as, as I'm a part of um, this fund, one of, the, uh, one of my jobs is to create these theses around uh, you know, what's working, what's not, and, and, and within the OpenStack, um, ecosystem, uh, just wanted to see um, uh, you know, what has happened over the last three, four years. And um, uh, I will just run through um, a couple of slides real quick, and then um, we'll jump into uh, introduction and then questions. And then I want to leave um, enough room towards the end so that uh, all of you can uh, ask questions too. Okay. <coughs> Um, so, um, so yeah. So as as I was uh, preparing for this last night, I saw this uh, on my feed. Um, oh boy! And uh, Sean, this is Sean, and yeah. I was really you know hoping everybody will show up here, you know, 9 a.m. So thanks to all of you also to be it, here. It was the MetaCloud and, party last night. So. <laughs> So, Star Trek theme. So you're, Doing you're all right. Doing all right. Ready, yeah. Ready I just had four shots longer. of espresso. So. I, I wish I could <laughs> claim something so mundane. You don't want to know why it was late. No problem. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks for for every uh, every one of you who has showed up here. You know, 9 a.m. Thursday. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, just just wanted to you know quickly see uh, what the landscape looks like. And, and this, this is um, some data from Q4 of last year. A um, lot, of, lot of startups, the, these are just the startups uh, you know, where, where uh, funding has gone in. Uh, this is from your slide um, uh, yesterday, Randy, um, from your uh, state of the stack V4. Uh, 502 companies, more than 500 companies in the ecosystem. It's, it's certainly getting bigger. Yeah. And where we are now, uh, if, you, if you see, um, we are headed to some really interesting times, as, as, as you mentioned. That's right. Uh, but what's, what's, uh, uh, what's really uh, interesting is what comes beyond that, that, that um, age where you know, there, there's stability and, 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 and there are some real nice businesses still to be made, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I think the first generation of startups had a bunch of challenges, including mine. Um, and I think there's an, uh, you know, a lot of times people haven't seen it. I don't know if you've seen it before, but in certain technology venues, there tends to be first, second, third, fourth generations of startups actually doing stuff. So I think there is a good opening for the Gen 2, Gen 3, OpenStack uh, startups. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so, so from here, um, if you see where, uh, who are the people who are uh, investing? So these are some of the investors who have um, done two or more deals. And uh, as, as you can see, there, there is uh, a lot of money that has uh, gone in. Mm -hmm. And uh, now what has happened uh, towards the end of the cycle, th these are some of the companies um, uh, that, that, that were acquired recently. Um, and, and, and we have, um, so, so when I was uh, uh, you know, looking at building this thesis, um, uh, what better way to, to, to actually bring some of these uh, companies here and, and, and hear from them you know, what worked for them, what are the patterns, you know, is, there a, is there a formula or, 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 or a set of things that, that you guys did right, right? And, and, and you um, uh, went here. Uh, so, so we have um, uh, MetaCloud, we have uh, cloud scaling, and, 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 and Joe, I've heard some, some rumors there 
So, so, so we have, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you will uh, uh, deny or, or, or uh, you no, know. No, I mean, no, we're, we're, we're out to, to, to build a business and that's the, that's the path we're on. Perfect, yeah, yeah. You, you are on that path and you, you provide that unique perspective to this panel. Um, yeah, why'd you invite me? I'm not acquired. <laughs> No, it was uh, not just based on the. We invited you because things. you're a nice guy, Joe. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, so this is this is a fantastic panel, um, and 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 I'll go through some of uh, my questions. But towards the end, I want to leave enough time for all of you. You know, if if you have questions, you can just line up here, um, uh, on, uh, in front of this mic, and and, and we'll take those. So to, to just kick it off, if you can uh, maybe quickly go through your, um, your background, just a quick introduction. Maybe, Joe, you can start. Sure, uh, yeah, my name is Joe Arnold, and I'm one of the, the co-founders of SwiftStack, and we build a product around OpenStack Swift. My, you know, my background is an engineer, and so I come at it from, from that perspective, and uh, back in the day, building network management, infrastructure, uh, cloud management, and saw an opportunity uh, to, 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 to launch a startup, and it was something I always wanted to do. And you know, been, have all the bruises of going through that process, coming from the engineering side, product side, and having to learn all about uh, starting a business through this, through this journey. So looking forward to sharing it with, it, with you all. I'm Randy Bias, the, uh, formerly the CEO of uh, Cloud Scaling. I'm still getting used to saying I'm at EMC. It's already been six months. It just rolls off the tongue. CEO of Cloud Scaling. Um, Cloud Scaling was one of the earliest proponents of OpenStack. We were part of the launch in summer of 2010. Um, a lot of the other startups you heard of, um, you know, had, didn't even weren't even aware of OpenStack at that time. And then we built some of the first clouds, built the first Swift cloud outside of. Um, outside of Rackspace, which actually Joe led while he was working um, as a cloud scaler. And, Everything I owe to this guy, man. Um, and uh, he, uh, he did a kick-ass job, and, and you know, that was like six months after OpenStack was launched. So I mean, you know, it was rough, <laughs> rough around the edges. Um, and uh, so I've been in this thing from the very beginning, and I've been on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors since it was formed. Uh, and then my personal history is predates OpenStack. I was one of the big cloud bloggers and pundits, and I personally have been a hands-on infrastructure engineer, network system storage, information security for 25 years now, um, for better or worse. Great, uh, Sean Lynch. Um, let's see, I got my start in the 90s at uh, City Search, of all places, a small idea lab-based company at the time, uh, pre-startup, or pre-IPO. Pre and. Um, Got into infrastructure engineering there. They had a bunch of fancy turquoise SGI kit that I wanted to play with. So, got uh, you know, I thought, like, wow, Cray Lincoln computer sounds fun. So that's how I got into to infrastructure engineering. Um, and then uh, City Search and, and Ticketmaster merged. Um, I ultimately moved to Ticketmaster, um, rebuilt that platform with a small team, um, and, and grew the systems engineering team, infrastructure engineering team there. Ultimately, headed up uh, global operations as SVP there, and um, in 2008, we embarked on a private cloud pr uh, project there. At the time, we didn't have OpenStack, so we built our own orchestration system. And we were using, I think, the open source version of Zen Server, and, but built something that was able to support the third largest e-commerce engine in the world. You know, we were transacting about $9 billion a year on, on that platform, a uh, ton of tenants, you know, learned a tremendous amount. Um, so took that experience and, and founded co-founded MetaCloud, um, a gentleman by the name of Steve Curry, who ran global storage operations at Yahoo. Um, and uh, the core cloud engineering team from Ticketmaster ultimately uh, joined me, and so that was the basis for the technical team at MetaCloud. Um, you know, one of the things when we get into business model, and I'm sure we'll talk about things like minimum viable product, it was kind of interesting, we were, we were seed funding, funded in August of 2011, and we had Disney up and in full-scale production by April. So, you know, it was super accelerated, super minimum viable product, um, and, you know, I'd be happy to talk about that more. Awesome. Yeah, that's, um, that's perfect. So j just wanted to kick it off with those early days. Uh, you know, Joe, you talked about those uh, dimly lit rooms and, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what was the life like, and uh, how did people take you seriously at that time? Like, how did you hire those initial few uh, I mean, I, key hires? And I mean, I think it goes back to those, those first early customers, customers that you want to go out and, and get. 
um, you, there's, you have to work really hard to convince them that they should work with you. And honestly, the type of customers early on could do it themselves. And it's almost a barometer. And then there's customers like I think that we're all consuming. So we had we worked with a few telcos early on or service providers early on, and man, they just consume so much of our team. And those not, weren't necessarily like the, the good ones to start out with. Um, uh, for us, it was working with uh, some of the web scale guys early on um, because they really didn't have any other options out there to, to, to get a product from. And we just applied people. Maybe it's kind of similar to what you guys did, or you just kind of showed up on site. And yeah, we, we just we had an idea and a structure of the product. And we had the, the early version, the minimum viable product early on. And then we just worked with them to make it work. And we were lucky enough in the early days uh, to find a customer who's willing to, to pay us a, a license plus pay for engineering work. And that was almost a funding event in and of itself. Um, and obviously, it was hard to find. But that's kind of what you need in order to kickstart and get the, get the, get the company off the ground. Yeah, I think overselling or over-servicing over first servicing. customers is yeah. super important. Absolutely. I mean, we were, we were basically Disney's cloud operations team. And they had to, like, whenever they wanted, yeah. you're yeah. there. And, and it was good. It made the product much better mm -hmm. as a result. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Randy, uh, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I mean, you know, I remember in 2010, spending most of our time uh, ten engineers in a room, small dingy room. You were talking about poorly lit rooms in the middle of Seoul, Korea. Um, you know where? I mean, look, the air conditioning wasn't very good. The building was an old central office that hadn't been used in 10, 15 years. There were abandoned floors, and we were in Mukdong, which is in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, and um, you know, even before that, it was really crazy because you know we had inked two multi-million-dollar deals with Internet and Korea Telecom simultaneously, and we only had three employees. So I was using my personal network to basically shotgun everybody together and like whipping up employment contracts while getting on planes to fly to Korea. I get to Korea, and they tell me within three days I got to present to the entire Korea Telecom uh, executive team. And um, so 20 people are supposed to be there. 75 show up. Um, and I'm like, you know, basically <laughs> have an interpreter and I'm going through and walking them through sort of the early stuff on like, what is cloud? Like 2010, right? Summer or spring, late spring 2010. And um, so it was a lot of crazy stuff like that. Um, in terms of sort of customer learnings, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it, it was good to bend over backwards for those early customers that were in our, in our professional services era, but it was also really bad. Right, I mean, we chewed up an entire team in, in Korea. I mean, we, we just lost the team because it was a year of basically sitting in those hot boxes and it was tough. And Joe is running another team in the US for the other project. And you know, with the product customers, it was actually easier when we made the transition to being a product company, we would lose the customer, but we wouldn't chew up the teams because it wasn't, um, wasn't the meat cloud to keep it all going, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so you can kind of do that a little bit. And, but the thing that, we found personally really tough is that we were funded as a software company and uh, we were taking on the mission of really delivering almost more like a hardware experience and the problem was is that customers all wanted white boxes from super micro and quanta and all that they want to reduce their cost but those things actually don't maintain themselves it's not like from dell when you get like a particular model of box all the boxes are the same or pretty close and there's a lot more variability in the white box supply chain. And so we took on kind of managing that. And so our kind of cost structure as a business was more like a hardware appliance business, even though we were funded like a software yeah, company. It, you're bringing up a good point. And I, it, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to diverge no, no, a little ahead. bit from go the actual ahead. question. Because I think, I think the most interesting thing with this panel and the space is the, uh, the variety of business models. I think that's the really right. interesting you know, piece here. And I, I think if you look at the OpenStack space you know, amongst this group and, and the others, um, that differentiation of business model, I think, was key. Because, I mean, rea realistically, we all had great teams. We all had fantastic engineers. We all had great technology. And we were all using OpenStack. Um, so there wasn't that much differentiation there. I, I mean, really. I, I, so I think if you look at where the differentiation actually existed, it was delivering OpenStack you know, in an appliance like Nebula, or delivering OpenStack as software, 
um, like maybe a piston cloud or del delivering OpenStack as software you know, in a highly opinionated manner. With, you know, I, I know Randy said a lot about making your private cloud look and feel like the public cloud, right? So that's a very kind of opinionated um, yeah. play. And I think you know, you're obviously delivering software. So you know, we, we were delivering OpenStack as a service in a very SaaS-like way. And honestly, we didn't start with OpenStack. I mean, these guys got into the OpenStack space you know, before we did. Um, we set out to build a IaaS as a service business. Um, we looked at Amazon, namely you know, EC2, and we sort of broke it up into components and said, well, what are they doing well and what are they not doing well? They're selling cloud as a service, and that's really differentiated, and there's a lot of value there. But they're also selling access to x86 equipment, which isn't special at all, right? And so we thought, gosh, can you just take the cloud as a service piece and just deliver that anywhere? Behind the corporate firewall, co-located, on the public side, on the private side, drop the public-private monikers and just deliver cloud as a service somewhere. And, um, and that's really where, so we actually started with CloudStack for like two weeks and, and realized that it was just an awful, awful, awful stack and, and moved to OpenStack pretty quickly. Um, but, but I think that's the interesting point. Like I, I'd love to talk about, you know, we, we had a, a reoccurring revenue stream. You have that kind of um, annuity effect you know, with a SaaS-like business. And I, I, think, I think that's what amazed me most. I don't know what you guys think, but the differentiation in business models I thought was fascinating mm -hmm. with the early guys. Because we were very different. We were. And I think we could take on a product-oriented approach because we didn't try to, try to do everything. We were focused on one project in the OpenStack ecosystem. We could take that independent of the rest of OpenStack. And so it was storage. And we could go and deliver just the storage stack. And for that, a product worked really well, because we didn't have to deal with as many integrations. And then the integrations we did run up into, we, we could bolt on directly to our own product, which we could have a lot of control over. And, and so that's why I think it worked for us, um, because it was, it, was a, um, it, it was more self-contained. Maybe not necessarily less complex, but more self-contained, yeah, and we could have more control. Yeah, over. when we talk about fundraising, one thing to realize is fundraising is wildly different. You can, be, you can all be OpenStack companies, but when mm -hmm. you're delivering you know, a capital-intensive business like an appliance or pure software or SaaS, the makeup of your investors are dramatically different. What we as investors you know, look at, when uh, your revenue mix from services or from product, uh, the, the kind of multiples that you will put on services is, is, is much lower, and, and the right. kind of investors you, right. uh, you, you can attract and, and, and uh, will actually fit really well with what you are doing are different. Yep. So what, what did you do um, so early on, uh, and, and, and then those um, uh, initial to sort of mid-stage, uh, that, that initial round of funding with Jerry and, and, and others, and, and, and later on, what kind of things did you do? Um, how did you, what were the challenges, like OpenStack? Uh, uh, yeah. At that time, the perception was very different. Today, uh, it's a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but what did you go through well, there? Well, early on, we made a lot of mistakes, right? So uh, when, we, when we first went out to do, do fundraising, I mean, it took a lot of guidance uh, from, from folks. To, uh, that, that we trusted who had gone through this experience lots of times to set us straight. But when we first started, we were trying to raise way too much money, um, way too complex of a, of a structure um, when we went out. So, and we just couldn't get that done. Once we got maybe a little bit more realistic um, with, our, with our fundraising approach, then found uh, investors who had the same belief in where the market was going as we did, um, we both, Sean and I both share an investor named Ryan Floyd. He's actually be in the next session here, so stick around and listen to him. Um, uh, but getting that investor on board who believed in us and the market and the team was great. We had a lot of things wrong in the beginning. And we had investors just flush us out because, oh, your pricing model is weird, or your delivery mechanism is, is not something I understand. And they're like, by the way, they were right. And we changed our model, and we changed our pricing structure and the form factor of our product. Um, so it's not like they're wrong, but it was important to find that investor it, who... It, I would just add to that. It's so those. critical to get the right investor at the right phase. Yes. So Ryan Floyd is probably the best early stage investor that I know of in the Valley. Like, hands barn, down. Hands down. Like, even, if, even if he doesn't invest in you, he's going to... He will roll up his sleeves and, and get, do a tremendous amount of work, but mm -hmm. stay out of your way and give you autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then, you know, I don't know if you guys know Maha Ibrahim. She was our Maha Series B investor. She, that's a great Series B investor. Yeah, Maha is an example of someone who looked at us and she was critiquing our business in the early stages. And yeah. she was exactly right on where we ended up. Yeah. But because we didn't, weren't doing it that, that way, she's like, no, not, not right now. It's really important. Yeah, it's really important to have the right investor type at the right stage. Uh -huh. And even important. when you're going out and pitching different investors, being able to pitch to those types of people who are going to give you that feedback yeah. is, is and, great. And don't worry about, I, I would say don't worry about logo with the, with the VCs. I mean, don't look out you know, to go be you know, Sequoia funded or, you know, it just, it's about the partner. Think about who you want on your board. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing, really. So what was the point where uh, you, know, you, you, you knew you were ready to go to you know, Ryan and, and, and uh, what, what was that transition point? Uh, we, had a, we had some revenue, some customer traction, and, and that was, was enough of a proof point. And we had, enough, we had enough of the larger deals that were either in a POC phase, a paid POC phase, that showed some, some credibility. And that's when, we, that's when Ryan Great. stepped up. Perfect. Yeah, let's talk about uh, those that in, in, during that phase. You know, when you were growing, uh, at that point, you know, how you were for for, for um, all of you, how were you competing with uh, you know where, where you are now? You know, these big guys. How were you uh, getting that business, and, and what kind of things were you doing um, during that, that that growth phase there? Well, I, I don't think we were competing with each other. I mean, at all. The market's so big. I, I mean, it was very. Our very number one competition was DIY. All yeah. the time. Yeah. I lost Same half here. my deals to DIY. Yeah. I think we encountered each other once that I know of. Um, Piston three times, Nebula no times. Uh, what about Cisco's and EMC's? And what no, about none, of, none of them were in the market at the time. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were the only guys in the market. It was basically us and VMware. Yeah, I mean, I didn't start to see Red Hat and Mirantis until last year. Mm -hmm. And then they showed pretty heavily. But up until then, it was just the startups, and I saw them very rarely. Most of the deals I lost were, like I said, DIY. People were convinced that OpenStack was easy, and <laughs> they thought that they would just download it and sprinkle it in their data center, and then poof, you know, they'd have a magical cloud. I got to tell you, I, I saw that a million times. I know both I you guys did, too. I, love I, it. I loved it, too, because everyone thinks OpenStack is a product, and it, I can't believe people still think that. I mean, it's not a product. It's a series of raw bits to build a well, product. Part of, part of it is mistakes on the part of the foundation and the community. In the early days, you'd have, you know, the website would say, cloud operating system. Of course, it's not an operating system. And the evangelist would be out talking about, just download it and get it up and running in your data center. It's like, no. Well, it, but, it's, but not we, a, it's not a product. <laughs> it, we, we loved it, right? So because I mean, what we did um, is we, wrote, we had a product, a commercial product, and then we also taught people how to roll it out and deploy it by hand. We did both. We, didn't, we, didn't, we were not a services company, but what we did was, look, if you want to roll it up and do it yourself, that's actually demonstrating our value to us. And by the way, if you are going to go run it by yourself, then super. You're going to be a contributor in that community and we're going to get code from you because it, you're going to have yeah. to in order to I, I to agree. I mean, it was, it was also really easy when you follow a DIY because you can show a model, right? You can yeah. say, look, I know you tried DIY. All right. You know it takes two or three people to curate upstream, yeah. to look at what's coming. The to, best to, customers were the people who had done DIY, but right. the problem is, is that that takes 18 months, yeah. which is a, a, you know, for a startup trying to get traction, you know, is a little bit of a death now. You guys... I don't know about you, but you definitely started a ways a after point. me, and I started early, and it was it was effing hard to like close customers. You know, I had I, I remember I, I lost Symantec, and you know they're a big big OpenStack deployment now, and I told VJ at the time the architect, I said you're going to run into all these problems, and I just laid them all out for him. He's like, ah yeah, it'll be no problem. I'm like, you're going to have to hire like 50 engineers to like get it to where you want it to be, and he's like. Ah, I it was. It, it, I'm, I would not finished. I'm not finished. I'm not okay. finished. And then nine months later, I go back and he's like, Randy, you are right. You are right about everything. I had to do all this stuff. And I'm listening to him tell me how he rebuilt my product inside his business. I'm looking at him and I'm going, you're like an antivirus and security company. Why the hell are you building your own product to build a cloud? Like, like, it, like it blows my mind still. Yeah, and I would, I would just say that, you know, how much of our time do we spend educating people about OpenStack? Mm -hmm. right? All like, of it. <laughs> yeah, and, and so now the sales cycle, you know, it used to be probably a 10-month sales cycle for all of us, and I saw it compressed to six months, three months, two yeah. months. 
now it's, yes. it's pretty immediate. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that was just training around, but this is why open uh, for, for Just me, real was, quick, was, um, uh, for um, uh, all of you, if you have questions, if you can start lining up here, and then we'll um, um, uh, start taking those questions. Also. Yeah, for, for me, for yeah. us, the, the sales cycle was shortened not by more education on OpenStack. It was, it was about more focus on use cases. And if one thing that I wish we had done sooner, it was figure out what those very, very specific use cases are and go after them sooner. So, yeah. OK, storage, uh, let's be a backup target. How about that? You go into these OpenStack environments, and people are doing this POC. They're having to get their engineers, their developers. They're having to get so many people on board to start using the system that it just takes a long while for the adoption to occur. But it's much better to go to those guys and go, hey, you're in charge of this particular workflow. Why don't you connect the dots yourself? Um, it just That's been a huge shortening for the sales cycle for us. Great. Uh, any questions from the audience? If not, I'll, I'll uh, Keep go on. to the next one. Uh, so uh, from, 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 from that uh, you know, stage of growth, uh, what sort of things, as, as, as uh, you know, uh, they say, it's never too early to, uh, to start thinking about the end game. Um, uh, I know there's always you know, this goal to build uh, an independent big, big, uh, big enough think, business. You don't think about the end game. You can't spend time on it. You're building the business, like Joe said. I mean, if you, if you, if you fixate on the end game, like hey, how many people have ever played baseball or a sport or something like this, right? Most of you. If you ever are in the midst of it and you start thinking about whether you're going to score the goal, what happens? You, you lose it. <laughs> Right, yeah. you know, you you can't think about that. You just don't. You're like, it's day to day. You're like, what am I going to do today that is going to move the business forward? Then the next day, what am I going to do today today to move the business forward? You're not. I I wouldn't I wouldn't plan out longer than, than like a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Pretty I long. think my yeah, board would my board would have, have issue with that. No, but, I'm, I'm uh, not talking about the long range <laughs> vision and the strategy of the business. I'm talking about the the tactical stuff because. Right. You know, one day, you know, the emergency is that customer. Next day, it's there's a person who's problematic on the engineering team. The next day, you know, there's something happening with the customer in production. So you, you can't. Yeah, but you got to have, so you have milestones for the stage that you are in the, in the funny, come on, right? Come no, on, no, 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 no. Of course you have milestones. But it's like, but, that's, but you're not marching towards a, an, an exit event. So I, no, I kind of agree with, with, with both you guys. I think if you focus on running a business really well, by the time you're approached by a serious suitor um, with a serious opportunity, chances are you're going to have many millions of dollars in the bank. Uh, you're going to have really meaningful revenue, really meaningful margins, a really meaningful portfolio. Um, and if that's the point where you're at the table talking about a potential sell, uh, you, know, you have all the leverage in the world. And, and you know you can walk away and have a sustainable business, or you can go raise another round really easily. Um, you know, but if you're on fumes, you know, you're in trouble. So um, that's the difference between an exit at X versus an exit times X times 10 is, is you know, having some cash in the bank. You know, we're, uh, you know, I think we had, I think we had about 15 million bucks in the bank um, and meaningful revenues and a relatively small team with a relatively low burn rate um, when we started talking to Cisco. And so it was a good position to be in. Right. Uh, so, what what, uh, uh, what were the things that drove you to EMC and Cisco um, at that point? Um, uh, you know, what, um, uh, why those were the, uh, that was the right thing to do at that time? It, so, I, I will kind of ag agree a little bit with Joe in that you're you always have to you can never think about selling your company. You don't want to be there from a mindset point of view, but you always have to be willing to do it. Um, you have to realize why you're there. You're you're, you're not there. For any self-promotional, you know, I, I think a lot of founders get caught up in their own um, egos. But uh, you're there to maximize the return for your board and your investors, and that's why you're there. So anytime you're approached, you have to take it incredibly seriously. Um, we were approached by multiple large-cap, uh, you know, companies at the same time, and I think um, from our point of view, you know, Cisco has a tremendous amount of vision. Um, I think if you look at what they're doing with InterCloud, the InterCloud Alliance. You know, their open stack uh, support thus far. Um, our vision was really well aligned, so I, I think it was a good fit for us. Great. Perfect. Uh, how's, um, so po post uh, acquisition, uh, how's life now? Uh, it's really great for me. 
I mean, I have no complaints. My team's seated, they're all happy. Um, they're working on a new product, and I'm kind of out in a CTO role. And the way EMC structured is you've got the core technologies division, which has all the old school stuff, and then you've got the emerging technologies division, which has all the new scale out software that's meant to disrupt the existing business. And then my job is to come in and disrupt that ETD uh, emerging technologies division, so to cause awesome. them grief. Um, and uh, so that's, it's like the perfect job for me so far. Great, great. <laughs> Sean? Uh, it's been great. Uh, you know, Cisco's been super supportive. Uh, I mean, if you look at even just, uh, you know, the event here, I mean, we've never had this type of budget to put it on event here. So um, super supportive. Um, we have a ton of autonomy. Uh, I, I, you know, I will say that anytime you're acquired, if you think about it, you were acquired because you were out executing the company that bought you, most likely. Mm -hmm. And so as a small team. So typically, you know, you were thinking one way, you were executing one way, and you're likely going to be buy, purchased by someone who is thinking differently or executing differently. So um, by definition, that means when you get inside, you're going against the grain a little bit, right? And you have to kind of realize you, you're, you and your team are going to be a catalyst for change. Um, that's what you were purchased to do. So, um, you know, that, that's not an easy job. I mean, that takes a, a lot of endurance, and I'm sure you're experiencing that too at EMC. I mean, it's just... I yeah. don't know. They really want the change. <laughs> it yeah. hasn't been too bad. Yeah. No, they want it. They want it at Cisco too. But it's it it's it's work. You have to do roll. Do they really slaves. want it, Sean? They do. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, okay. look. I, I look at uh, Lou Tucker. I mean, how how invested is Lou in, in the business in, in OpenStack? Lou's awesome. Don't. There are other parts of Cisco though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't encountered the other parts yet. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, we can we can start with the questions. Uh, go ahead. So my question is on the in, uh, seed funding. Uh, your opinion on getting the seed funding from a traditional VC versus going to firms like VMware and uh, Brocade or Cisco to get the funding. Uh, what's your opinion? Uh, disadvantage, advantages, if I have options? I don't, mm -hmm. like, if I would say one thing, I'd say try to avoid seed funding if you can. I mean, the thing that I learned the hard way is that customers are king. If you have customers, even if it's a small amount and a little bit of traction, like they'll extrapolate the value of that for you. Um, and you know, as far as the strategic investors go, it's different money than VCs. It's very different money. The way they think about the world is different. Sometimes they want to attach strings to it. If you're doing seed funding from them, which I actually don't know that they do seed funding very often, but if they were to do seed funding, you know, you've got little or no leverage. And so I would say, you know, do it on, you know, start the thing, you know, basically from your garage, essentially, until you've got some customers before you do any, any funding. I, I did funding, uh, so we were doing seven million in trailing 12 months revenue for, as a professional services business <laughs> when I took $4 million in funding to be a product company and shut the tap off. And that was really, really hard and we did it with no customers. I, I, so I, I think it's different based on the type of company you're starting, B2B versus B2C, what space you're in, technology, et cetera. Um, I will say, and I suspect, I haven't talked to Joe about this, but I bet he'll agree, that for us, having a very sophisticated investor day one was incredibly helpful. I mean, it was someone that, you know, again, I can't say enough good things about Ryan, but having him in day one was, was super helpful. And it, also, you know, if he seeds invest, they're gonna they're gonna do your A round, right? So yeah. I mean that's sort of a known, and so they're with you. They're, they have some skin in the game, and that's super important. And the other thing about if you get strategic investor, just understand what your what your that that company, and they have a an agenda that they're trying to pursue, and they want information about different markets. And if that's in a space that you're in, they're gonna under, they're gonna have access to the financials, and hey, is this a hot category or not hot hot category? And so they're not necessarily, they're doing it for other reasons than just a financial return. So just make sure you consider that. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, always think about, you know, with these uh, strategic investors, uh, there could be some doors that you're closing um, in the future you know, yes. from market perspective or- Yeah, if you or, go get funding from like uh, Juniper, you can't go get- Go to Cisco. Cisco. So, so just keep that in mind. You know, and they're gonna have to see other people say even opposite stories to everything we just said too, right? Which it, getting an investment a strategic investment from somebody has opened up channels into that company, but I don't know. I, that's not necessarily I, what I would bet. I would go as far on. as to say, don't ever start with a strategic. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, yeah, I think Later you on. want an institutional investor early on. 
Um, it gives you credibility for your subsequent rounds. Absolutely. A tremendous amount of credibility. Um, yeah, and I think it's more important to just have the right lawyers. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Like um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. This has been uh, extremely invaluable. So my question is on MVP, the minimum viable product. What should we actually have as an MVP before we either go to a customer or uh, go for funding? Because it's kind of a chicken and egg approach normally I've seen, that you start building something and you go to a customer, customer, I want A, B, and C more, then you go back, and by then you have so many competitors. So should we just go with an idea? Is that better or should the, we start building a product? There's an idea. And then there's like something in between an idea and an MVP. Like, you know, some people I know, like they consider the MVP to be a slide deck that explains how the product will work. And they'll go out and they'll run that by dozens and hundreds of customers first, incorporate the feedback you're talking about until they actually have something that's material. And, and they may not write any code then, they'll try to go get that funded. That's legitimate. But I can guarantee you that whatever idea that you have for your business, by the time you get done, um, you'll be doing something else. Like, I, you almost never see, like, how yeah. many people know where Twitter came from? Twitter came out of a podcasting company called Podio, which died because iTunes started delivering podcasts. And these guys had this little app that they used to coordinate lunch in San Francisco. That's where Twitter came from. I mean, that's just the norm in You're going to pivot. Land. You're going to move left and right and zig and zag. Did you guys but, pivot? We pivoted. No, not, dramatically. Re not really. Yeah. No. I um, mean, we started out with a, a, a product concept, and we... Yeah, it wasn't the first version wasn't very sophisticated, but it was. It what was if you the, look at it from the point of view that you were cloud scaling version 2.0 when you basically figured out that Randy had his head up his arse and wouldn't like focus on Swift and, and peeled out? Why did it take until 2.0? <laughs> <laughs> but we but we had we had we had when we when we first were talking to customers, we had something that at least got Swift up and running. That was like our minimum product. That we could show customers, and then we just iterated on on that from there. But I, you know, just as a as a rule, just earlier is better. Don't hole up for six months trying to build something. It'd be kind of the general recommendation. I, I would agree, and don't keep your day job while you're working on your startup. No, don't. that's an awful idea. I've seen so many people do that where they're working part time mm -hmm. on their day job while they're trying to get their startup off the ground. You'll never be successful. Uh -huh. I, you need the you need the gun to your head of that being your only job. To, to, to make it successful. Yeah, I'm going to temper that a little bit. I think that's generally true. But I, I, you know, what I did in the first go around, the startup before cloud scaling, is I was doing consulting. And I had set up the consulting structure in such a way that it was more like half time, but I was able to put the, the bacon on the table. So that way, um, you know, I would, um, I'd have like three full days per week plus the weekend to actually work on the startup mm -hmm. stuff. So you can, you can do other things if you need to, if you really have to bootstrap it, but you can't be working a full time regular job for sure because that's just the, none of those take nobody here works 40 hours a week right so i'd say raise enough before your mvp to at least focus on your startup 100 percent that's just my uh, one quick question um uh, i know that we'll go into what sort of opportunities exist next for OpenStack in our next panel uh, but just wanted to ask you guys if you were starting today like your uh, you know that uh, with with your jobs that you have now you know that that other thing uh, what, what are those exciting areas, if you were starting today, uh, around OpenStack, what will those uh, companies be? Um, if I was going to start over now, I'd, be, I'd do what, kind of what Joe did. I'd focus on components. Like, we tried to like, deliver the distribution, and we eventually did, right? I mean, our, we were very successful at Walmart, but you know, that, that's just very hard to do as a startup. You really need a lot of money, so I think it's better to go peel off a piece, whether it's in storage or computer networking and policy management or whatever, I think it's better to peel off a piece. Cool. Uh, I'll be a little controversial. I think the trains left the station as far as starting an OpenStack company. Uh, I think you're racing dollar for dollar with many, many you know, companies with many, many, many billions of dollars in the bank, so um, that wasn't the case when we all started. So. Um, I'd probably go up stack. I, I think there's interesting, you know, I guess maybe I have a bias toward uh, as a service SaaS type businesses. I think data analytics as a service, that type of business, um, you know, Cassandra as a service or, or that type of thing, um, sort of cloud agnostic. I think that area of the market hasn't really been as, as penetrated as it could be. I think there's a ton of opportunity there. I'd plant myself in a vertical and I would take whatever industry that I knew really well and I would see how I could deliver that with this delivering whatever it is 
as, uh, as software on commodity equipment using OpenStack to, to power that. Um, that's that's the, where I think you'd have to figure it out because I think just doing technology is mm. very, very difficult right now because there's so many players out there that are trying to do it just from the pure component. Right. Or, you're, you're, you're doing awesome uh, within Biopharma, for example. Yeah, Biopharma. Um, like, we're trying to take on take. Biopharma Media Entertainment right now, and yeah. that's, that's working because we're putting a lot of energy and focus to it. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, just one quick question. Yeah. Oh. So everybody talk about this MVP. So I think uh, we are uh, oh. out of time, unfortunately, oh, really? but we'll, we'll, uh, okay. uh, I think we'll, we'll be here for some time. And uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, uh, please, uh, uh, a round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you.